Welcome to the gathering place right here in beautiful Simi Valley, California. We're so glad that you could join us tonight. <clears throat> and, um, you know, sometimes you think you know what you're going to teach on and then God will change you. He did that uh, Saturday. And um, actually, that was, to me, that was one of the really fun teachings on prayer. And it was uh, Luke 11, but there was more in there than I even realized. <clears throat> so that was fantastic. Uh, last night, I should say early in the morning, kind of just before I wake, woke up, I had a healing dream. And what was the dream? Well, the dream was the scriptures just coming to me, like literally being quoted to me. You know, Isaiah 53, Matthew 8, and 1 Peter, just just flowing into me. And they actually changed me. Like, like I could feel the transformation and I woke up feeling, and, and listen, I pray, I prayed to the last second when I went to bed last night. And I'm telling you, I woke up feeling changed, feeling transformed. <clears throat> so I'm hoping that comes through tonight. And I want you to understand this. As you see that line there, it says, Prayer transforms you. People don't realize that when they're praying in the Spirit, that they're actually, they're changing. If we don't heal the sick, it's not, it's not because the promise isn't true. It's because we haven't been transformed enough. So the more you pray, the more you transform. And one day you transform enough to where you just, it just happens. So tonight, um, for the offering scriptures, I'm going to do some healing scriptures because I really want to bring out a lot of things about healing. And so if you're looking forward to financial scriptures, whatever, well, we'll catch up on that Saturday. But Matthew, and I'll say this, that I, I believe that God gave me the dream. Um, I've been praying for some friends in another state that have a, a, a real need for some healing. Um, so I think that one of the reasons I had that dream was on their behalf. And <clears throat> so really tonight, I'm teaching this message for them. You just happen to be here helping me. So Matthew 4, 23 said, Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues. What was he doing? Teaching. People don't realize the thing that Jesus did more than anything else was teaching and preaching. Teaching is revelation. Preaching is inspiration. What was he teaching and preaching? The gospel of the kingdom. So I, Jesus didn't just go out and heal. He was teaching and preaching. Now there were people that came to him and they would say, you know, Lord, come heal my daughter. She's at the point of death. Uh, so he's coming with her and the woman came up in the press behind and touched his garment and she was healed. And he said, daughter, your faith has made you whole. But they came to Jairus and they said, your, your daughter's dead, trouble not the master any longer. But Jesus, for some reason, seemed to think that the healing covenant also encompassed raising of the dead. Because he went in there and everybody was weeping and wailing. And um, he said, she's not dead, she's sleeping. Isn't that funny? He said the same thing with Lazarus. It's like Jesus, you know, he just had a vocabulary problem. He'd fit right in with the crowd today. <clears throat> he didn't know the difference between being dead and sleeping. And um, I said they mocked him, they scorned him, and so he threw them all out. If you're going to have miracles, you're going to throw everybody out that's not there with you. If they're not there with you, you've got to throw them out. I said he was healing all manner of sickness and disease among the people. Matthew 9 35, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness, every disease among the people. This is something a lot of people don't understand about healing, that healing is based on a covenant and the covenant is in the scripture. So Jesus wasn't just going out there and arbitrarily saying, I'm Jesus and I'm here to heal you. Because, you know, if he did that, why didn't he do it in his own hometown? Why didn't he do it for the scribes and Pharisees? Why didn't he say, I'll show you who I really am here, be healed? No, it says, it says in Mark 2 that, actually, I'm sorry, it's the Luke version of it. When they dropped the guy down from the roof, it said the power of the Lord was present to heal them. 
but none of them got healed because they couldn't receive what he was saying. So you have to be able to receive what he's saying, and that's the gospel of the kingdom. Can't have any doubts. So he was, what was he doing? Teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Mark 2, and again, he entered into Capernaum after some days. It was noise that he was in the house, and straightway many were gathered together, insomuch there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them. You don't preach your feelings, your ideas, you preach the word. Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't uh, give his testimony to the devil when he said, the devil said, if thou be the son of God. He said, wait a minute. He said, man shall not live, he quotes the scripture, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You have to answer the enemy with the promise. And Jesus did exactly that. He answered with the promise, he answered with the word of God. It's the same with healing. You have to answer your body with the word of God. Amen? Because your body speaks to you. Remember when Jesus, I couldn't believe this, I was listening to something on Elijah's dreams, and, and uh, the guy goes, uh, Jesus, you know, he, he was an- the, the tree answered him. I'm like, you just now saw that? No, the tree was speaking to Jesus, the fig tree. And he answered the tree. No many fruit of the hereafter forever. What was the tree saying? I don't have any figs. The tree was the circumstance. The circumstance is speaking to you very loudly. So what do you have to do? You have to speak louder or have something stronger than the circumstance that's speaking to you. So what did he preach to them? He preached the word unto them. In Luke 5, it says, but so much the more went there a fame abroad of him and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed of their infirmities. So Jesus wasn't just accidentally healing people. He had a very deliberate way that he healed the multitudes, and that was he was preaching the word. In Luke 6, 17, it said, He came down with them and stood in the plain of the company of the disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. They heard him first. Jesus always spoke before he healed unless somebody came in with faith and snatched the healing. The disciples did the same thing. In Luke 9, 6 said, they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Matthew 10, these are just the warm-up scriptures. These aren't the covenant scriptures we're going to talk about. He said, as you go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now look what he said. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. Cast out devils, freely have received, freely give. Why aren't we raising the dead? Because we don't believe that's part of the healing covenant. But raising the dead is part of the healing covenant. It, it's a part of it. It belongs to it. Amen. Well, Bob, you know, there's less, there's, there's less levels of dead, you know, right? <laughs> Yeah, I realize that if somebody's head gets cut off, it's a little bit more difficult. But you know, Kat Kerr, something that she said, that God showed her in one of her visitations to heaven, she said, not only are we going to be raising the dead, but we're going to be raising them out of urns, out of ashes. Well, that's on us. That's on us to pray into that place, pray into that position to where we can see it. Bob, I can't even see that. I know, or you'd already be doing it. If you can see something, you can do it. But if you can't see it, you can't do it. Jesus said, I do nothing except I first see my father do it. So even Jesus couldn't do anything until he first saw it. So we have to see it. And I like to tell the story when uh, I went down to Mexico with Gabe Torres and we were doing some meetings and um, we got there, you know, I wanted to get there a day early, but we got there like a day and a half and all I did was pray and meditate, yes, on the scriptures, but also on seeing people healed for like two days. And then we had the next day for the meeting. So it was, it was almost like two and a half days of just praying and seeing images of people being healed. And then uh, when I preached, you know, with an interpreter, sometimes it's a little rough in the beginning. I'm not sure how good the message was, 
But I called out a couple of words of knowledge and people came up and, and they just, they got healed so dramatically that everybody just came up. <laughs> they weren't waiting. And, um, except for one person, every person there got healed. Um, the one person that didn't get healed was spreading gossip rumors about the pastor. So that was kind of like God saying to everybody there, <laughs> you know, this guy's lying. But really, his gossip blocked his healing. Oops. Okay. All right. So those are our offering scriptures tonight. So at this time, we are going to receive the offering for the gathering place. So for those of you that are giving, making out checks, make it out, please, to the gathering place. For those that give to Soaring Ministries. The same thing, if you're doing it by text, you can scroll down to either one of those. All right, pray this prayer with me. Father, I love you. Thank you for the covenants that you've made through the ages to bring me into relationship with you. The covenant with the woman in the garden. The covenant with Adam. With Abraham, Abraham. the covenant with Moses, Moses. and finally the covenant with Jesus. Jesus. All of these covenants, covenants. so that I could know you personally, so I could come into the holiest of all, by the blood of Jesus. And I come there now, and I ask you, Jesus, as my brother as my high priest priest. to present my tithes and offerings offerings. unto the Father Father. as an offering in righteousness. righteousness. Let him be a sweet savor savor. unto you, Father. Father. And I humble myself tonight tonight. by reminding you of the promise promise. in Malachi. Malachi. I prove you in this way. And I thank you for the opening of the windows of heaven to pour out a blessing there's not room enough to receive. And Lord, we thank you for the rain here in Southern California that you have been giving us. And we thank you, Father, that you rebuke the devourer for our sake, that you're driving down the inflation, that you're driving down oil and gas prices. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and if you notice, we've been saying that long before it happened, but it began to happen after we began to say it. Amen. Why? God needs somebody who agrees with Him. What do a lot of Christians do? I'm sorry, ushers, go ahead, receive the offer. What do a lot of Christians do? They agree with the news report. America's going to hell in a handbasket, you know, and, 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 and. Listen, you can look at things and say, yeah, that was really stupid, like, like, uh, going from being an energy independent country to not, to being dependent on all these other countries. So no, was that brilliant? No, that was, that was not brilliant. But the thing is, if we start agreeing with that and we start saying, well, there's nothing we can do. We, we have to wait for an election. No, we begin to speak into our nation and our state as we see fit. We begin to declare what God is saying. Well, California, you know, it's really going down. No, California is a righteous state. I declare it. I declare the righteousness of God is taking over our state, yes. transforming our state, yes. transforming our school systems. Yes. Yes. You can be marred by what you see on the news, or you can pray and declare something exactly the opposite. Yes. All right. So let's look at the promise. Now, some of this you know, so try not to get bored over these first few scriptures, please. I'm asking for your help. Isaiah 53, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when you shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So Jesus wasn't necessarily the most handsome person that ever lived. When you would look at him and say, yeah, an average guy. It said he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. 
He was despised and we esteemed him not. So he was rejected. Anybody ever been rejected? Isn't that one of the great fears that people have is to be rejected? He was rejected by everybody, including all of his disciples, and betrayed by one of his closest. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Now let me just read a couple of definitions. They're a little bit smaller. I didn't enlarge them, but the griefs are what? Malady, anxiety, calamity, disease, grief, sickness, sorrows, anguish, affliction, grief, pain, sorrow. These are the things that he bore on our behalf. The Passion Translation, which I'm going to read two verses, but then we're going to spend a little time on verse 4. Yet he was the one who carried our sickness, endured the torment of, the su- of our suffering. Now this is speaking, this is the promise. This is speaking of something that he would do in the future. Yet everything that Jesus did was built on this promise here. Even though he wouldn't take stripes until he went to the cross, this was the promise that he would go to the cross, and he did everything based on this promise. We viewed him as one who was being punished for something he he himself had done, as one who was struck down by God. But it was because of our rebellious deeds that he was pierced, because of our sins that he was crushed. He endured the punishment that made us completely whole. What? He endured the punishment that made us completely whole. And in his woundings, we have or we found our healing. Now I want to just say this, that this goes beyond just physical healing. This goes into the emotional realm. I've found a lot of times, especially when I go out and I'm praying a lot, I go to the places that I'm praying, I find a lot of time that there's something within a person's soul that stops them from being healed. That the healing power is there, they have the faith to be healed, but there's something in their soul where they can't forgive or they can't believe that God loves them enough, and it does not allow them to receive the healing that belongs to them. It's guilt. That's why, that's why righteousness and healing go hand in hand. But Bob, you don't know what I did. I, listen, it doesn't matter. There's no level. Peter, who was sitting there saying to Jesus, tonight they will all deny you, but I'm going to stand by your side. And he meant it, and he, and he tried to kill Malchus, the servant of the high priest, But ultimately, he rejected Christ. He betrayed him. He denied him three times. Pretty bad. Pretty guilty. Do you know that's why three times Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? Why was that? He understood that Peter was still living in some level of guilt over what he had done. And so he was giving him questions that would open his heart so that he could restore him. It's the guilt and the condemnation that hold us back from really healing, moving in healing. When you pray in the Spirit so much, you know, I said when you fast and pray, it's to buffet your soul. But when you pray in the Spirit enough, you don't even always feel it at first, but it does something to your soul. It It transforms your soul to where suddenly you can receive what you couldn't receive 10 minutes ago. What? But this is the promise that it's built on right here in Isaiah 53. This is your covenant promise. But Bob, you always say 1 Peter. This is 1 Peter before there was 1 Peter 2.24. So let's look at a couple of other translations of the, the fourth verse. The New International, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. So he took these things up and they looked upon him. They said, surely nobody could look the way that he looked on the cross unless God was punishing them. He wasn't some like sweet looking little guy on the cross, you know, standing up there all handsome and everything. His face was bloated because they pulled his beard out and thorns in his head. His whole head was bloated out. 
stripes all over his back. He was mangled up and ripped apart. He looked grotesque. And they looked at him and said, only God could, could do that, something that severe. Like he's being punished by God. He did. He received our punishment. So if he received my punishment, why would I then take it back? Unless I just don't know better. However, it was our sickness that he himself bore and our pains that he carried. Yet we ourselves assumed that he had been afflicted, struck down by God and humiliated. So it was our sickness that he bore. He bore that. Our pains, our diseases. But he lifted up our illnesses. He carried our pain even though we thought he was being punished. Now, we don't need to read the bottom part of all of these. Isaiah 53, 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Now, he's speaking as if it's in the right now. Isn't that like it's in the right now tense? With his stripes, we are healed. But then it seems like for that to happen, he would have to take stripes. Yet he was healing everybody before he ever took stripes. Why? Because he understood how to take a promise from God and bring it into right now. That's what Abraham did. It took him a long time. God kept promising Abraham something over and over. It took him a long time. But after he met with Melchizedek, something changed in him. King of righteousness, king of peace. Something changed in him. And he believed in the Lord. And it said it was counted to him for righteousness. Jesus knew how to receive the promise from Isaiah 53 and bring it into the present. Even though it was based on what would happen to him in the future. The New Living says, He was pierced for our rebellion. Crushed for our sins. That's all the stupid stuff you've ever done. Every dumb thing you've ever, the most idiotic, stupid thing you've ever done, he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. Listen, if you're going to heal the sick, you have to get rid of sin consciousness. But I'm responsible. I know. He was crushed for that. So he's lifting the responsibility from you. He's lifting what you deserve from you so you don't get what you deserve, which is what? Sickness and disease, in this case. In the case of of bearing your sins, you don't get death, hell, and the grave, because that's what he bore. But what do most Christians sit around doing? They look at their life, and they look at circumstances, and they say, I must have done something wrong, therefore God is doing this to me. It's such a lie. But it's a really good lie. And it gives you a reason why. It gives you an excuse as to why you have not received something from God. Well, I just, there are just some things that I just haven't been, you know, and I'm. So no matter what wicked thing you've done or how bad. Is it more powerful than the blood of Jesus to forgive it? See, that's what you have to understand. The blood of Jesus can forgive it. And just like the blood of Jesus can forgive it, the stripes of Jesus can heal it. Oh, Bob, I treated my body bad all my life. Listen, you could treat it the best of anybody all your life. You might live a little longer, but you're still going to die unless you start to overcome death. He was pierced through. I didn't read that last part. He was beaten so we could be whole. I like that translation because it's not just about being healed. It's about being made whole. Just like the leper. He was whipped so we could be healed. New American Standard. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastising of our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. 
How are we healed? By his stripes. By his stripes, by his scourging. Is it by anything you do? It's not by anything we do or didn't do. It's by faith. It's by believing that what he said is true. It's by accepting the promise. Jesus was able to accept the promise in Isaiah 53, the promise that was made about him. He was able to accept that promise and walk in it. We have every excuse in the world, every reason why we've done something wrong or we're not right or we're not, and there's always something that's telling us we're not good enough, we haven't done enough. Bob, you always tell us we need to pray more. Well, you do. <laughs> but that's beside the point. The promise is the promise. The healing is based on not what you've done or what you can do. It's based on what he's done. The prayer simply, when you're praying in the Spirit, it's simply removing the equation of the unbelieving soul going, no, I deserve the sickness. No, I deserve the sickness. No, I deserve this. And just pushing it away. It's the same thing as Adam in the garden. When the voice of the Lord came in the garden, the cool of the day, Adam, where are you? No, I'm over here, hiding. What are you hiding for? I'm naked. In other words, I'm not good enough to stand before you. There's something wrong with me. How do you know that? Did you, did it, did, you know, it was something that he did to himself. God didn't push Adam away. God's in there looking for him. Adam pushed God away. That's kind of like healing is. We think, well, if I do this, 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 maybe God will heal me. No. It's by the stripes we're healed, and we just need to get our soul out of the way enough. How do you do that? There's two ways. Pray in the Spirit and take the promise and keep going over the promise again and again until the promise becomes more real to you than the affliction. But honestly, praying in the Spirit goes a long way to helping that happen. Are you with me? You can, like some of you feel, you feel like, I could just take my healing right now. And you can too. I'm not going to stop you. Amplified, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our wickedness, our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing. The punishment required for our well-being fell on him. The punishment... So you can have well-being. It fell on him. And by his stripes, his wounds, we are healed. Not by us. By his stripes. He was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. Why are you reading so many? Because I want to pound that promise home. He was wounded and crushed because of our sins. By taking our punishment... He made us completely well. Now, I'm not saying you can go out and eat, you know, hosted Twinkies, you know, 20 Twinkies a day and expect to live long. <laughs> you know, you actually have to put things in your body that feed your body. You understand that? I think we understand that. Because of our sins, he was wounded, beaten because of the evil we did. We are healed by the punishment he suffered. We're healed by the punishment he suffered. We're healed by the punishment he he suffered. You didn't suffer. He suffered. How dare you get healed and you didn't suffer for it? No. He suffered for your healing. But if you suffer for your healing, then he can't suffer for your healing. Made whole by the blows he received. He was wounded for our rebellious acts. He was crushed for our sins. He was punished so that we could have peace and we received healing from his wounds. More, yep, one more. He was wounded because of our rebellious deeds, crushed because of our sins. He endured punishment that made us well. Because of his wounds, we have been healed. Whatever is whatever's blocking my soul, I want to get rid of it right away. Why? I don't know how to do that, Bob. Man, if only we had somebody that could teach us how to do that. I got an idea. Jesus said, I'm leaving you a teacher. 
He's better than me. It's called the Holy Ghost. He's going to teach you everything I said. Him? He's my teacher? Yeah, he's your teacher. But, all right, I'll pray 20 minutes a day. All right. I'll be glad to do your funeral. Anyways. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God laid it on him. Why? To make us, not listen, not just to heal us, to make us whole, to make us sons, to make us stand in his presence. Completely whole. Listen, if there was any single person on this earth who fully knew who they were, they would never age past 30. They would never, you know, if they broke their leg, it would be healed immediately. Anybody who ever, the only reason we don't have everything that God has promised is we don't really know who we are. Jesus had everything God promised because he knew who he was. See, this is a Superman jacket. You know who the real Superman was? Jesus. <laughs> he could walk through walls. He could walk through crowds that wanted to kill him. Now, he didn't, people, didn't beat people up, but he did throw some people out of the temple. He could cause nets to be filled with fish. He could turn water into wine. Superman can't do that. He could see into the hearts of men. Superman can't do that. He could take himself on a whole boat and be transferred to the other side in an instant. Superman can't do that. He can multiply food. Superman can't do that. But, but, but Superman can fly. Yeah, Jesus, Jesus not only flies... Because he took off. He flew when he took off, but he can fly in other dimensions. Plus his angels, one of his angels could wipe out 184,000 people in one shot. That's just somebody working for him. He's a bad man. Okay, we're just going to do this. Just these couple scriptures we did right here. And then we'll go back to some teaching. So I want you to do this with me. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for relief. By the way, when we do this right now, I want you to close your eyes because I want you to receive healing in your bodies. What if I don't need healing? Then receive the healing anointing. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for releasing your healing mercy. Into my, body into my body by the stripes of Jesus. By the stripes of Jesus. Father, in heaven, Father in heaven, I see your angels, see your angels. Healing, and my body. healing and restoring my body, bringing me new body parts, new body parts. from your heavenly storehouses. Your heavenly storehouses. I, declare I declare my body, my body is, becoming is becoming more youthful every day. Every day. Surely he has borne my griefs. Sickness and, sickness and disease, carried my sorrows, carried my sorrows. Anguish, affliction, and anguish, affliction, and pain. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. I'm sorry, you don't need to say that. But he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And with his stripes... I declare, I declare, my body is completely healed, is completely healed. Whole, whole, restored, restored youthful, youthful, strong, strong resurrected. resurrected. I receive resurrection life, receive resurrection life into, my body. into my body. It's one of the things that Simeon Kayu, when we met with him in Uganda, he had raised 12 people from the dead. He said that he he would speak to the life of God that was in them, that he would speak resurrection life. So I was messing around with a friend of ours. He had a staph infection. And I was a little like, like we were going out to dinner, a couple of us, a couple of couples, and we were going out to dinner, and I were messing around. I said, I speak resurrection life to your staph infection, just like, like play, playful. Ten minutes later, he comes back. He went to do something. He comes back. He goes, Bob, my staph infection completely left. 
powerful. Resurrection life is powerful. All right. Let's look at the next part. I might have to move a little bit quicker. The next part is the manifestation. So instead of just going right to Matthew 8, 16 and 17, which is the manifestation of the promise, let's look at Matthew 8 and go down and read down. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. So I like to call this, this message a day in the life of Jesus. So he comes down from the mountain. He's, you know, it's the, the Sermon on the Mount. He's worn out. It's a rough sermon. Fills up several chapters in the Bible. So that's a big deal. And behold, there came to him a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will, be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy was cleansed. In the book of Mark, the same story, the leper said, Lord, I know you can heal me, but I don't know that you will heal me. He said, Jesus moved with compassion, said, I will. And he healed him. And Jesus saith unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priests, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. When Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. I mean, if Jesus said to me, I'm going to come and heal him, I'd be like, that's the answer I was looking for. But this guy, look what he does. Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. He's totally humble. But speak the word only. He understood the power of the spoken word. I just don't feel that good today. I'm not worthy that I should have come under my roof. Speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. For I'm a man under authority having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go and he goes. To another, come and he comes. And to my servant, do this and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed truly or verily, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Why was his faith great? Because he understood authority. What do most Christians do it for healing? Pray for me. Pray for me that I be healed. Well, wait a minute. Are, do you believe in Jesus? Yes. Or did you just get saved like last week? No, 30 years. <laughs> so you're still a baby after 30 years. Now, I'm not trying to be mean. But... Somewhere along the line, we have to grow and understand that we are the ones that have the authority. Jesus, Jesus was praising this man because he understood authority. Jesus had authority to heal the sick. He understood it. He said, you don't have to come to my... He literally told Jesus how to heal his servant. He said, you don't have to come to my house. You could just say the word. Why? Because he understood authority. That's one of the greatest things that praying in the Spirit will begin to transform you is into the realm where you understand authority. This man understood authority. But you know what? Prayer lines and handkerchief tables and all those kind of things, they can rake in a lot of money. We'll, we'll pray for you. Listen, I love praying for people and I pray for people all the time. God brings people before me. I like to pray with people, not so much for them. I like to agree with them. I like them to have, I like them to, to be at war with me, not warring just for them. Because that way, next time they need war, then I have to war for them again, instead of learning how to do it with me and do it together. This man told Jesus how to heal. He said, uh, just say the word, my servant will be healed. Kind of like the woman when she said, the woman that pressed behind, she said, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be healed. Uh, so when she was healed, she's like, ho, who touched me? Peter goes, <laughs> he looks at the other disciples and goes, <laughs> now listen, you don't think they thought Jesus was a little touched? You don't think they made some jokes about him? Because he was so eccentric about things? Oh, they did. Ah, master, the multitude is thronging thee. How do you say, who touched you? Like he's, he's asking him a legitimate question, said, hey, everybody's touching you. What, do you. what do you mean? He goes, no, no, I felt virtue go out of me. 
she determined how she would be healed. Jairus, the guy that Jesus was walking with, he came to him and said, Master, my daughter's at the point of death, but if you come and lay hands on her, she will live. He told Jesus what to do. He was like, if you do this, she'll live. That's, he had faith in that. The centurion had faith in his word. She had faith in touching his garment. We have the promises that we can have faith in. Jesus marveled. It said he marveled. What is great faith? Come on behalf of somebody else. Understand authority and humility. Both times Jesus spoke of great faith. Those are the three factors right there. Continue on. I say unto you that many shall come forth from the east and the west, shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, that's not you, by the way. You know, just because you watched the YouTube and some guy said, I saw a million Christians in hell. He didn't say anybody in hell. Or if, if, well, let's just say this. They're not Christians. Because once Christ is in you, the seed, that seed cannot go to hell. Amen. And Jesus said unto the centurion, go thy way, and as thou hast believed, be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. When Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever, and he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose and ministered unto them. She didn't just get healed over like, you know, an hour. She got healed pretty quickly. Whatever fever she had, it was gone. Bob, did you hear about the new thing going on in uh, China? There's a new virus, or there's something going on in China. Yeah, I'm not worried about it. I'm not thinking about it. What do you think? I'm thinking about this. Now, this is after he preaches a sermon on that, all this stuff as he's headed somewhere, headed toward Capernaum. So this is all on his journey. He didn't have a flying car, and for whatever reason, he didn't take his disciples' hands and go, ready, guys? You know, and just go. He only did that on the boat. The 16th verse. When even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick that it might be fulfilled, that it might be fulfilled, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself, took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. He was fulfilling the prophecy in Isaiah 53. The Passion Translation. That evening the people brought to him many who were demonized, and by Jesus only speaking a word of healing over them, they were totally set free from their torment. And everyone who was sick received their healing. In doing this, Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. He put upon himself our weaknesses and carried away our diseases and made us well. He's talking about Isaiah 53. But he still, he hadn't taken the stripes yet. But he was operating in the promise of it. He was operating in the promise of Isaiah 53 and what he would do. Are you saying we can operate in things from the future? Do you remember that song that Kim Clement used to sing? I'm somewhere in the future, and I look much better than I look right now. I'm somewhere in the future, and I look much better than I look right now. Now, wh whatever you thought about Obama, one way or the other, he quoted him. He said, as an evangelist in Los Angeles says, he didn't know what a prophet is, so he said evangelist. He's like, he's like a, a, a Baptist or something where you have, you have teachers and pastors, that's it, or evangelists. Evangelist is a guy that comes in and teaches once in a while in your church. And the pastor. We used to have evangelists come to the Nazarene church. So. No, he was a prophet, but at least he got the saying right. The Passion Translation, that evening the people brought to him many who were demonized and Jesus only speaking a word over, of healing over them. They were totally set free from their torment, and everyone who was sick received their healing. In doing this, Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. He put upon himself our weaknesses and carried away our diseases and made us well. Can I read a couple of other translations? Yeah. Yeah. 
This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. And remember, that's not just infirmities, disease. That's everything, including and up to death. Because that's what he told his disciples to do. Heal the sick, raise the dead. Which, by the way, he did himself. Oh, and one more thing. Jesus did not have as good as covenant as we have today. What do you mean? Nobody was born again. He didn't need to be born again because he was the son of God, but nobody was born again. Nobody was filled with the Holy Ghost. They couldn't be. There was no covenant for it. It says in Hebrews, we have a better covenant established upon better promises. Do you think we have a lesser healing promise? People say, yes, healing, healing passed away when, when the disciples died. Well, where's the scripture for that? I don't know, but it's, it's somewhere there. That's a, that's a religious spirit, a legalistic spirit, because that spirit tells the world that the church is not a supernatural mechanism. When you look at any movie when the church is portrayed, it's portrayed as a bunch of nice people. How nice was Jesus? Throws the guy out. Throws the guy out because they're defiling the temple. Calls them corpses. <laughs> he was rough on his own men. Why did you rebuke the storm? What's wrong with you? We're just apprentices here, and they were pretty young guys too. We're just apprentices. You know, we'd never even seen this. But he was like, like, why did you do this? Why'd you wake me up? I'm having a good nap. I'm tired. I did a lot of stuff today. I need some rest. Next time a storm comes, you rebuke it. Pretty rough character. Now, he wasn't a mamby pamby guy. I mean, he's, he's like building furniture and lifting stuff. This muscular guy. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, who said, He took our sicknesses and removed our diseases. This was fulfilled. What was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, he took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Brand study Bible. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took on our infirmities and carried our diseases. Give you a couple more. Oh, just only Nathan? Forget it then. <laughs> okay. I'll tell you later, Nathan. Okay. So say this with me. I may have said it last time, but we're going to say it again. The first part, I'm just going to speak out. The second part, you're going to say with me. When even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. He cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. That it might be fulfilled. Which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Saying himself, took my infirmities and bear my sicknesses. Okay, you still with me? Do you need to stand and stretch? Are you okay? Okay, all right. So now we come into the fulfillment of the promise. But it didn't happen until, I mean, Jesus had been healing multitudes. The fulfillment of taking the stripes didn't happen until he went to the cross, but Peter brings it to our remembrance. Because the disciples... Isn't it funny that they didn't stop healing the sick after Jesus was resurrected from the dead? No, that all passed away when Jesus left. No, they kept doing it. And they passed it on to those that came behind them. All of the disciples of the early church were healing the sick, raising the dead. Peter raised the one woman from the dead. You know, they came, I think her name was Sharon. They came to him and said, oh, this woman, she's a wonderful person, and she's da-da-da-da-da-da-da, and they said all these wonderful things about her. 
And um, he goes in, and, and it just kind of goes face to face with her, and pop, and coughs, and then, yeah, and then she's raised from the dead. Peter's walking down the street, and it said just the shot. People were just waiting to get in his shadow. Why? So they could go tell, hey, I saw the Pope walking down the street. No. <laughs> that they might be healed. Who his own self bear our sins and his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness. By whose stripes you were healed. Passion translation. He himself carried our sins in his own body on the cross so that we would be dead to sin and live for, live for righteousness. Our instant healing flowed from his wounding. His wounding, your healing. You guys getting tired, a little bit tired? Let me read you a story. Bedtime story. <laughs> Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that was born blind? You know what the early, you know, the, the people before the church was even born, they equated sickness with sin. His disciples equated sickness with sin. Uh, and they're saying, well, who sinned, this man or his parents? Jesus answered, well, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents. But the works of God should be made manifest in him. Well, he didn't say, he's not, he wasn't saying, God did this so I could do this miracle. He wasn't saying that. He was saying that sometimes because we live in a fallen earth, things happen to people. And we have to, you have to understand that or you're going to go crazy about certain things. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is today. And the night comes when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. When he thus spoke and he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, he anointed his eyes, eyes of the blind man with clay. He said, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seen. Now, there's, there's a couple thoughts I have on this. You remember when Jesus filled up the water pots and they were turned to wine? That was a direct violation of the law of the Pharisees that they had made up. It wasn't in the scripture. This was, a, this was another law that they had made up. So Jesus was breaking the falsely made pharmaceutical laws by making the mud put in this man's eyes. But I also believe this. I believe that by doing this, I don't think this man had eyeballs or not, or not fully formed. And so Jesus took of the dust of the earth, which his body was made of, spit into it, with his healing saliva, put it on there, and their eyes formed. I think you guys have had enough. It feels like you've had enough. So let's just tell this story real quickly. The guy they let down. Jesus said, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Verse 8. Perceived in his spirit, they so reasoned in themselves. Or from verse 7. This man speaking blasphemies. Who can forgive sins but God? Why reason you these things in your heart? What's easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up thy bed and walk? But that ye may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He saith, Sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Rise, take up thy bed, go thy way into thine house. Immediately he rose, took up his bed, and went before them. Bob, why did you put this story in with the other things that you're saying about Isaiah and 1 Peter and Matthew 8? Because in all of those, the promise is not based on anything we have done. The promise is based on everything he has done. He forgives our sin. 1 Peter, it says, who his own self bear our sins. Didn't, it, said, it didn't say first he bear our sickness, it said he bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. In other words, he took our sins and gave us his righteousness. And by his stripes we're healed. Because righteousness, the gift of righteousness and healing, always, always go hand in hand. They always go together. 
And that's what all those other scriptures are saying. That's what he's saying here. We're not going to take the time to go through it, but he's saying the same thing here in Psalm 103. Forgives all thy iniquities, heals all thy diseases. When the sins are forgiven, the diseases are gone. What are you saying, Bob? I'm saying there's a lot of people living in sin consciousness, struggling to find why, why God's not healing them. Why haven't you healed me? Number one, he's already healed you. Everyone, every, every born again believer has already been given the covenant of healing, but not everyone is healed, but they have the covenant of healing belongs to them. Well, what, what brings healing? Destruction of sin. What brought death? Sin. What brings healing? Destruction of sin. What brings life? Destruction of sin. David understood this because he was one of two people in the Old Testament that walked in righteousness. Look what Jesus said here. He's talking about Abraham. If he's justified by works, he is whereof to glory, but not before God. What saith the scripture? Abraham believed God was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now he, he uses Abraham as an example, but then he goes to David. Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without work, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now our sins are not just covered, they're washed away. David and Abraham both walked in righteousness in time of law. In other words, they walked in the promise before it was time, before, before the promise had arrived. But that's exactly what Jesus did. He walked in the promise of what he was going to do. It was the promise of Isaiah, but he had not yet taken stripe. He walked in the promise before he had fulfilled the promise of taking stripes. David cried out for healing, and he was healed. Healing was in the Old Testament. They didn't have as much of it, but Jesus came, and he was literally walking in the promises of the Old Covenant because it was literally there in those promises. And he brought them into the present. And David is used to remind us of this. He walked in righteousness in time of law. Last one because we're out of time. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. This is the King James who walked not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That's not there. It's not in the Greek. It's, it's unbelievable that, I, I think even the King James should just take it out of there. No modern translation has that. Why? Because it wasn't there. It was never there. Why'd they put it there? Because they couldn't believe there was no condemnation. The translators of the day which there were some like 50 of them, they couldn't believe there was no condemnation. So they took that part from verse 4 and stuffed it in there. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. If there's no condemnation, if the law of the spirit of life in Jesus makes me free from sin and death, and if sickness is born from sin, if I'm free from sin and death, then I'm free from sickness and disease. That's how Jesus was able to empty something like 500 graves on the day of his resurrection. Because he overcame sin. Now, we don't know how long they'd been in those graves. They could have been in there a thousand years. They could have been in there from the days of ancient Israel. When Israel had taken the land, they could have been, they could have been all those graves from ancient Israel when they were there. We don't know. It's a lot of people, right? Yeah. So, quick story. So John G. Lake, you all know who he is, right? Everybody knows who he is. So he's a great missionary to Africa. Has unbelievable healings in, um, in Spokane, Washington. That 100,000 documented healings. He had a hospital there. And and they would had x-rays and everything, but they'd bring people and they'd pray over them. They'd pray over them multiple times. You know, we're like, let's just pray over them once and if they have faith, they'll be healed. You know, no. They'd pray over them multiple times and the anointing and the glory of God would go into their bodies. And they'd go back and take an x-ray and, oh, the cancer shrunk. And then they'd pray for them again. 
And um, so when the British scientists and doctors came to help out in Africa because of the bubonic plague, and Lake was working in the middle of everybody, and they said, how is it that you did not get this plague? And he also was a scientist. He said, it's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Like sickness couldn't come upon him. You see, you're Kenneth Hagin telling those kind of stories all the time. But you know, you, know, you get, you get a, a COVID scare and everybody's like, oh, put the mask on. We better be careful. We can't come to church because we, we might get sick. <laughs> Any believer that thought that doesn't know what the church is. Maybe the church doesn't know what we are. Maybe it's the church as a whole. But John G. Lake, he took, there was somebody that died, and he took a, a slide and took some of the plague, put it on the slide, put it under a microscope, and they looked at it, and it was alive. He took it, put it in his hand, put it back on the slide. They looked at it, and it was dead. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus killed that plague. There's resurrection life inside of him. The last one here I'm not going to read to you. It's just about James saying, if any sick among you. But he said, if they have committed sins, they shall be forgiven. The forgiveness of sins and the healing of the body go hand in hand. Bob, I like, I like telling people not to sin. <laughs> well, that's great. You know, we want people not to sin. But Jesus forgave our sins. And the Holy Spirit, he wants to teach us what it means to really not sin. There's a lot of people that think they know what sinning and not sinning is, and they don't even know the difference. What do you mean they don't know the difference? The people in Jesus' day who were committing the worst sins were the leaders. It wasn't the church, but they were the leaders of the kingdom of Israel. It was the scribes and the Pharisees, the doctors of the law, the people who knew the scriptures the best, but didn't know the word. They didn't know the power of the word. They were the ones that were the most egregious. Not all of them. There were people like Jairus that came to Jesus at night. There were, there were people. There were honest priests and honest people there. But a lot of them, especially those in the highest positions, they were, they were evil. And they were committing the real sins. They were using the scriptures against the people or to control the people not to heal the people. Jesus came and healed the people, not controlled the people. You know what he didn't say? I know you got healed, but you need to come to my service tomorrow and bring an extra offering. <laughs> Never did that. Yeah. Let's stand up. We're going to just do a couple more declarations. I'm not going to do a bunch, but a couple. And then we're just going to release the anointing of healing and resurrection life. Say this, release my body! Death, release my body! Sickness, release my body! I command life! To come into my body. Live. I speak life. I command life to come forth. I speak the life of God. Resurrection power. Be released right now. In the name of Jesus. I command life. To go forth. Who? Who? I hope you receive that or release that. Just say this with me. I thank you, Father, thank you, Father for your resurrection life. For your resurrection life that was just now prophesied. That was just now prophesied. I receive it. I receive it into the top of my head. Into the top of my head. All throughout my body. All throughout my body. Down to the tips of my toes. Down to the tips of my toes. And everywhere in between. I thank you for resurrection life flowing through my body, driving out the darkness, driving out the sickness. I speak against death in my body. 
They call it age. I call it death. And I command the death to leave my body. I command life come into my body. Come into my body now. Live. Live. Shaka baboraka. Uri babati arakom bababachika. I break the covenant of death. Say it. I break the covenant of death. That I was taught and trained in. By everyone. All my life. I break that covenant of death. And I make a covenant. With the blood of Jesus. I make a covenant. With Romans 8 2. The law of the spirit of life. In Christ Jesus, I make a covenant with life. I break every covenant I ever made. With the spirit of death, I break your authority. I break any covenant that I might have made with you. I break it by the power of the blood of Jesus. And I release the life of God into my body. Into my soul. Hurisha baboti araka. He babo hore mbababata. Ha baboti kahare babo. Shom baba baba reya kohom baba baba rekama. He rokom baba baba chika ha. He rokom baba chika harona. Darom baba baba reya kohom baba baba. I see, and this could be for any woman, but I think I want to even say women. But I see in the lower part of my back, healing coming in and flaring out from my lower back into my hips. But this is for a woman. That could be for more than one woman, but I see heal anointing flowing from the lower part of my back into my hips. And I see transformation within the hips, not even just healing, but beginning to reverse. If you're a woman, whether you're here or watching, Just say, I accept resurrection life into my back and hips. I receive from the heavenly storehouses resurrection life into my body. New hips, new back. I receive resurrection life into the very cells of my body all through my body I can just feel something in my heart I just could feel my heart I don't know if it's anybody that's in here but it's maybe somebody that's watching but I could feel resurrection life coming into my heart it's like it's like somebody you get I don't even want to say quite pain but you get kind of a a, a little bit of a scare because it feels like something happens in your in the region of your heart and you feel a little bit you feel a little bit frightened by it. You feel like maybe there's a blockage and you're afraid to even go to the doctors and even become a little bit tired. But I'm telling you right now, there's resurrection life going into your heart, and God is restoring your heart. He's driving out the darkness. He's driving out even years of where you did the wrong thing. God doesn't hold that against you. Because He's good. We should all be dead and in hell because of our sins. But we're not because of His righteousness. Therefore, every wrong thing you've ever done in your body, Jesus loves you. And He took stripes to heal every wrong thing that's ever been done in your body. 
Rababo shakahari dari amomata. Rebabo babo rakam babo chakahari dari alolo koma. Him babo babo boho rakahandi a rain baba botoma. O re kam baba bo chikahandi a re kahahand o ramama. He a rom baba bo babo rakomama. The woman that I was feeling, the woman that I was feeling, the lower back and the hips. Sometimes your body feels stiff. And when you go like this, just moving from side to side, feels, it just feels stiff and hard to move. I'd like to pray for that individual. I know we prayed for openly for everybody. If you're in here, your lower back leads into your hips and it feels like your body's stiff. It just feels stiff. Not easy to not easy to move. I'd like to lay hands on you tonight. Are you? Okay. Beverly? your hand right on her lower back. Put on her lower back. There you go. Everything's going to flow from the lower back. The oil is flowing into your body right now. The anointing oil of heaven is flowing into your body right now. I don't know. I even I feel it like it's even flowing into your ears. How's that feel now, Yolanda? Oh my God! I like that. I like the "Oh my God" answer. Nice, huh? What is, what is the thing? He, and the, what is even? What is the thing about the ears too? I felt that oil even flowing into your ears. What does that mean to you? Have you had trouble with your ears, or, or, huh? When I was a kid, I had a lot of hearing, so someone must have. I never knew that. Isn't that wonderful that I never tell anybody. You never tell anybody. No, you've never said a word to anybody. Nobody I doubt any person here knows, except maybe Mark. That he didn't even know no. But God knew. <laughs> yeah, here, here he was thinking you didn't listen to anything he said. <laughs> and it was it was a problem. Isn't that wonderful that God just said that? Yeah. I love that, Yolanda. I love that. I believe you're going to see much greater healings when you're praying for people. I did see something when we were praying. I saw Jennifer, your left breast was going to be healed. Yeah. Your right breast was going to be healed. God has made you whole. Okay, let me say that out. Jennifer, your left breast is going to be healed. Don't be afraid because God has made you whole. And Edward, I'm healing your colon cancer. Edward, I'm healing your colon cancer. And I believe that because I know you for a long time. I believe that you heard from God on that. Isn't God good? Amen. I felt like I just, I did have to pray for that one person. I didn't know it was you, Yolanda, to be honest. I just saw the, the, the body parts that God wanted to touch. Until I laid hands on you, then I saw the ears. Which is amazing. I didn't know she, Yolanda said she had all kinds of infections and stuff in her. Now you're sitting there doing the stretches and everything. I, I take some of that. You know. Isn't God good? Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he amazing? When he does things like that, it's just to let us know that it's for everybody. Any one person that God touches, it's like he's saying, it belongs to you. So with that, we've gone a long time. I pray for you tonight.
I pray that God's healing anointing, his resurrection life would come upon you, would come into your body, would drive the darkness out of your mind, it would drive everything out that would hold you back from receiving what God has. I pray for God's grace to be upon you tonight. And I pray for his kingdom, his righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit to be with you. Have an amazing evening. God bless you.